Hey everybody, Jason here. I hope you're all doing perfectly splendid. Today, I'm gonna to be working on an iPhone 12 Pro PCB that was sent here all the way from New Zealand. So as you can see, this board came without the top shield on it. Thankfully, it doesn't look like we have, or whoever removed this shield has, overheated the board because we do not have any ball squeezage around the PMIC. Now, looking at this board with thermal imaging, I have confirmed that there is heat coming out from under this shield here, which is sort of ridiculous because looking at the board view, there's really only just some coils under here. See, if we look at the board view on this, we can see that you know it's got L9120, which that line is for LX DPMIC. <laughs> DP. So DPMIC, I am sure means display PMIC, or does it have, does it have a double PMIC? Do you think it? So there's really nothing under this shield that I think should be causing this heat signature. Uh, that shield is a little bit smashed, but also looking back over at the board view, if we look at the opposite side of the board from where that heat signature is, that is actually where we have this display. Well, you know, yeah, that is ex exactly where it's at, right? If we flip the board, uh, it's pretty stinking close, isn't that? So I think we're most likely not gonna find anything under this other shield that wasn't removed. It's probably what the last guy thought too before it got sent here. And um, are there any, I mean, any VCC main lines under that shield? So we do have VDD main coming here and here. I wonder if that shield might be like crushed into one of those coils and the actual short is not internal. Now there's no need to be barbaric here, guys. We can just, we can just add some flux to this and we are gonna lower the melting point of this stuff that's under the shield because it takes a lot of heat and uh, I don't wanna put that much heat on it yet. So I'm gonna take me a blob of low melt alloy and just start smooching this around the outside here. That was actually too much because it'll go under the shield and continue to travel. So same thing down here. And what I'm doing is just diluting the alloy, fellers and fellets. Thank you, Vice Grip Garage. And once it is diluted far enough, the whole thing will start to sort of let go. I'm actually not used to getting to this side of it so easily. There we go. Whoops. A little rough with that one. There we go. Yeah, it's like I thought. There is absolutely, positively, nothing under that shield that would cause this which means it's time to take that board apart. So I'm going to place this thing on a warmer, that warmer. Okie dokie, we have got this board almost all the way up to temp. So I'm going to go ahead and start warming it up farther. We need to get this board right below the surface of the sun so that it will separate. Thank you, Apple. I think I'm starting to see some flux bubbling. As soon as my blade goes in, I'll know we're getting close. No blade yet. Hmm. Ooh. Oh, 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 oh. Here we go. Drum roll, please. I'm going to start rotating my blade ever so slightly. Dude, these things take so much heat. I have got my hot air set at 340 degrees C with an airflow of 40. Okay, that's all that all that I can do with that side. I'm gonna flip it over and use my larger blade. We're just about there. Okay, down to the bottom end of the board. Come on. And off she goes. Turn off the heat. 
And let's just go ahead. I'm going to set the bottom board aside for now. If I was doing my normal just grind routine, as soon as I take the top board off and when I'm planning a reassembly while this is still hot, I would already be wicking and prepping the bottom board because it saves time and warming it up. But we're going after data here today. And right now, my primary focus is here on the top board, mainly because, well, it's had somebody messing with it and also because there's visible like smashing. So what does the rest of this board look like? We know what the top of it looks like. On the bottom side, I am expecting to see carnage. Like we had this shield down here, which this is where the, you know, that's where I had the bulk of the thermal imaging signature blazing through. So I'm expecting just on the other side of that to be some sort of carnage. I think it's just a little bit much for my to ask of this camera to focus on. So then let's put this under the microscope and see what it looks like. So under the microscope, the very, very first thing that I notice is this missing coil. These boards are just, they are notorious. Whenever they get slapped to have like a coil slung off of them like that, I'm gonna say that this display power management chip here looks to me like it is actually cracked in half. Oh yeah, it is so freaking lootly cracked in half. It's got, I can feel it. Like if I run my blade across it right here, I can actually feel it. But the best part of all of this, if we look right down here next to this chip, we have got a significant amount of ball squeezage. And this isn't just your typical ball squeezage, folks. This has happened without any underfill under the IC. So how about that missing coil? Is that gonna cause us a problem? Like, do we need that for data? I'm thinking probably so. So looking at that on the board view here, the missing coil is just below the CPU. We've got one IC and then there's the coil. So zooming in on that here on the board view, that coil is L4200, which is VDD main going to LX Sys boost. This is our charge charging coil. So um, I'm going to say yes, I will put a coil back in that place. Maybe. This is a dual purpose maneuver here. This gets rid of the thermal compound, but it also exposes any additional loose coils. All right, so let's grab us a brand spanking new DPIC. There we go. All right, so back over to the customer's board. I'm going to remove the busted up chip. I'm going to set my hot air to around 400 on this one. And I'm just going to be very careful. Let's not forget about the uh, LX coil over here. Oh, also, let's take note of pin one. Okay, I'm actually lifting the board up. There we go, board falls out from under. So yeah, this IC is definitely damaged. And um, let's see what happens whenever we clean it off and replace it, shall we? I would do some testing before replacing it, but this board's already hot. I have a IC ready to go, so I'm just gonna go ahead and stick the new one on here while everything's hot and ready. I might regret that later, but I, I don't think so. Hot and ready, that reminds me, I'm kinda hungry. Turn the hot air back down to 300. Okay, just about got this cleaned off. I see one missing pad. We're just going to ignore that. All right, let's just get the replacement on the board right away. I believe it's going to sit in there just like that. Maybe add a little bit of flux to it. any moment this is going to settle down onto the board nicely or it's going to blow across the room oh, we're going to settle nice all right so that is on the board 
I think I should go ahead and shine up this spot for this LX coil, shouldn't I? So, let's see what this, uh, let's see. It's probably got pads left on the board. I mean, the little remnants of the old coil, yep, it does. There we go. Let's see if I can get the other one off of there. There we are. I'm just gonna grab one of these big coils off of an iPhone 11 and see if it'll fit. Come on, baby. You know you wanna let go of that board. There we go. And then my plan is to just sit that right. Dang it, it's too big. So let's just grab this coil down here. Here we go. Now my plan is just to sit that right down in there. Oh, it's the same exact size physically, which means it must be perfect. All right, let's solder this down on there. It's actually probably most likely radically wrong, but we're gonna put it on there anyways. I'm not after proper charging. I'm just after a proper charging circuit. All right, let's just solder this right down on there nicely. Could probably just put a wire across it or not even worry about it. I believe this board will boot without this. We go. We're going to stop right there. Okie dokie. Well, then I have replaced the display power management IC and a coil. And I believe now when I hook this up to the power supply, our little short should be gone. So let's see what happens. Precious donor board. All right. It is just about cooled down. I'm going to hook up my DC power supply right here. And I'm going to turn the power supply on. We are drawing uh, an instant 900 milliamps current, which means this board undoubtedly has another fault. So I've managed to take care of the like blatantly, obviously busted, obvious short. Let's see if the infrared thermal camera is going to help us find the mystery short. So here we are looking at this with the infrared camera and top section first. I'm going to go ahead and blip the power supply on. I see one IC getting a little warm, but not 900 milliamps warm. So looking at the bottom of the board, uh, we definitely have something complaining over here. What is that? That IC lights up nice and bright. What is that? Like the boost IC or something? Having a look back over here at the board view, that IC, that is gonna be this one right here. Oh yeah, PPVDD boost. So this thing has, uh, this thing has a boost short. Let's see if this little camera is gonna help me find it. Now, it's not likely to be the actual IC itself. It's just that the IC itself is what's getting the most hot. This short is most likely somewhere else on the board. So to find it, I'm gonna to need to zoom out quite a bit farther to where I can see more of the board. And there we're actually seeing the entirety of the board. So we know that this area right here next to the boost IC is gonna get hot, but we're looking for another flash. Well, we do get the other flash right up there at the top of the board. So we've got boost IC heat down here, and then we've got another flash coming into play up here. What is that I see there? Hmm, let's see here, NFC underscore P. Does this thing actually have a cracked? So that chip is not visibly damaged. That boost IC gets awfully hot. What do I get whenever we check this with a meter? First, I'm going to locate VDD boosts here on the board view. And that should be easy to do if we just, you know, click around down by the boost IC. So it would seem that VDD boost is not even powering the NFC IC. So the little 
flash that we got out of NFC, that actually could be normal. Let's just check and make sure that VDD boost is absolutely, positively beyond a shadow of a doubt shorted. So having a look at that under the microscope, I'm putting my red probe on ground and I'm going to use my black probe to do the probing. And we are getting a 0 0.00 zero 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 one short to ground voltage drop to ground which means it is actually the boost line that it's shorted so i just i don't think i have allowed the thermal camera enough time here to solve the problem for me so to prevent from having to do any more thinking on this than i have to do um, we're just going to switch back over to the thermal camera and see if there's anything else, because I'm not thinking that that boost I see is gonna be the problem. So let's have a look at the top side of this logic board with the thermal camera. And I'm gonna turn the power supply on. Oh, hey, that's better. What is that? What was that up here? Let's just do that again. Ooh, look, we can see one capacitor. This thing is sense enough, sensitive enough to see a single capacitor, uh, I bet I can get it just a little bit closer. And there you have it. There is that area of the board. And there is a single capacitor we can see very clearly on thermal imaging. So that second row farthest to the left, look at that cap, it's already all knocked sideways. This is a cap that was disrupted when somebody was removing the shield, right? Is it okay for that to be touching the one next to it? That's not the actual that's not the short, is it? Yeah, it's completely okay to touch that one next to it. So let's just go ahead and give this thing a proper removal. I'll stick my blade in there right next to it like that. Now then, it's time to hook it back up to the power supply. I'm gonna turn the power supply, actually get my fingers off this board so I don't get blistered today. I'm gonna turn the power supply on. 80, 30, 20, 40, 20, 40, 20. One, zero, it's pretty okay. We're drawing zero amps. That's what we should be drawing. I'm gonna carefully lay this down on the board. And let me just go ahead and give this thing the old boot prompt, shall we? <sighs> Okie dokie, here we go. I'm gonna prompt this thing to boot. And one, two, three, boot. Nothing's happening. Maybe I didn't touch it right, right? Maybe I'm touching the wrong pins. There it is. I'm getting... Okay, so this board, it is drawing 70 milliamps in stalls. That most likely means it's in DFU mode or something. I'm gonna try just to hook it up to a dock flex and to my power supply and see if I can get a USB connect on a computer. So I've got it hooked up to a dock flex. It's hooked up to my laptop over here. Turn the sound up nice and loud so we can hear if we get a USB connect. There we're drawing 70 milliamps without the USB hooked up. Zero with it hooked up, so we're actually getting some charging current. But we have a 70 milliamp and brain dead. 70 milliamps and brain dead. Isn't that lovely? Okay then, well, what that means for this board to recover the data off of this, if at all possible, it is going to need a board swap. Um, the longer I spend with this thing, putting in voltage and screwing around and just, the more I do to this to try to not swap the CPU, the less my chances are being successful once I finally do swap the CPU. So this is going to need swapped over to another board if we have any hopes of getting the data at all. Now, I am faced with some hesitancy here. I, I'm sitting here, I've got an iPhone 12 Pro board all prepped up and ready and it is spectacular. But the board that I'm working on, this actually came from New Zealand and those boards, they're, they're different. So let me show you what it is that I'm looking at. Up here toward this top right hand corner of the board, you can see that we have got like a ton of components that are not there. And if we look on the donor board that I just finished prepping, these areas, 
they're actually populated. And that goes all the way over here. Um, that goes all the way over here to these capacitors here. They're not here. And look at this. These components here are not even the same on this board. They're, they're different components. And that's not the only differences. Now, the obvious differences on this is the 5G antenna. Um, the United States version, you know, they've got that annoying flex cable that's like literally soldered to the bottom of the board. And they also have this, this larger IC here on the bottom board is, uh, is there. Let me see. Let me grab a 12 Pro bottom board. I'm sure I have one laying around here just like everybody else does. Here is a United States 12 Pro bottom board. And let's just look at that side by side with the variant from New Zealand. And... You know, on the United States version, we've got this connector here for signal, but on the New Zealand version, that connector is not there. On the New Zealand New Zealand version, we're missing this. Now, I'm calling this New Zealand, but I should just say on the not United States version. So on the New Zealand board, we've got this huge BGA that is not there, but on our United States variant, it is there. And I believe this is just from differences in cellular technology and probably regulations and who knows what else they've got built differently on this board. So I don't care about RF, like it doesn't matter whatsoever if this bottom board is working. Now, I do care, though, if I put the chips all on the board and the CPU or the software says, hey, I'm the wrong board and it won't work. See, I don't think they've manufactured different CPUs and different NANs and stuff like that for these different board variants. The only real difference here will be the components that is on the board and should be the difference is are only related to RF and should not affect this thing's ability to boot and connect to USB, right? So looking next to the CPU, my customer's board, the components along the CPU look to be almost the same, except for this one little resistor thingy here is missing. And what I assume that is going to be, and what it is, is a uh, board ID. So we've got this one little resistor here they've pulled out that is changing the board's identification. Now, they typically use zero ohm resistors for these. That one resistor is the only thing I can see that's different. And that's going to be the resistor that tells this thing that it's not in the United States. So what I'm going to do here is... I'm gonna swap this over to a known good logic board, only I'm gonna to have to convert that known good logic board into the like European or other side of the planet version so that it'll work. So join me, start warming this up. I'm first going to remove NAND, we'll pull the CPU and then I'll go after the smaller components. Well, I wonder what's causing this thing to hang at 70 milliamps. There's no telling, but one thing I can tell you for sure is if I continue to try and do things, my chances of success by board swapping goes down dramatically. You know, there are actually odds that removing of that shield up top without using like low melt or anything um, could have caused a problem with the CPU. Um, not like damage the CPU, but actually caused it to disconnect. And that's why we're sitting here with a low amount of power and the thing's not going any farther. We're just going to swap this thing over to a known good board and... Um, I really don't like having the variable of not being the identical same board, but this 
get out of my way, you little resistor, or whatever, should not matter. Um, shouldn't, right? All right, let's pull the NAND off of here. I'm turning my hair, air up to 340 degrees C with an airflow of 40. Blades going in. NAND is coming up. Not the most pretty NAND removal ever, but We'll take it. And then while the board is still hot, I'm gonna start carving out the CPU. And we're gonna be, this is actually the only foreign version that I have here. So I'm gonna be excruciatingly careful not to disrupt the components around here. Normally on the donor board, I can fly through this because I don't really care what happens to those components. There goes a cap, you're gone. Um, I don't really care what happens to those components, but on this one here, we might need to go around measuring values, especially if it don't work. Just the other side. Let's see if we got a strip down here, probably a little. Okay. And then the top side. All right, that's all the glue removal. Boy, Apple really made it easy on the, uh, the 12 series. Like this is one of the easiest ones to do. So I'm gonna turn my hot air. I'm gonna go up a little bit because I wanna be very careful with this CPU. I'm gonna do 375C. And when I say very careful, I mean not tearing any pads. Um, I'm gonna try to keep the air spread out the best that I can. But as far as being extremely careful, I wanna make sure everything is melted before this thing starts to lift. So continue warming the entirety of this board up. I'm really hoping that no cracks or anything up here because this one, uh, this one got slammed. Okay, we are just about up to temp. And I'm gonna see if my blade will go in. It will. Boy, I'm a little warm on that 370. I don't wanna take my hands off of it, so I'm just gonna keep going at it like I am. Move down here. Just gonna back away a little bit. The CPU should begin to lift for us. There we go. Hmm. Look at what just happened, fellers. Do you see what I see? Almost all of the glue stayed on the board. I love it when that happens. But what I don't like is how this thing flipped off of there and landed upside down over here. That was pretty gnarly. All right, so that's got the CPU off of there. I'm gonna use one of these screen containers again. I like using these little plastic containers, but I've currently got them all full. All right, I'm going to go ahead and pull NFC and get it reballed. And you've seen me do that so many times, I'm not going to record it. I'll just skip past that part. All right, now before I forget, I need to switch the board ID. It's going to be one, two. Basically, we just need to get rid of a resistor, I think. So we need to make it match the foreign version. Number one, two, three, four, five, six is missing. I want to be sure not to tear up my board because I want to switch it back and use this for somebody else eventually if it's not done. Um, so let's just do one, two, three, four, five. I'm going to remove this with an iron instead of like ripping it off there. I'm worried that the pad is going to come loose and then 
I have to run jumpers or better yet, throw it away and get a new donor. One, two, three, four, five, this one. There we go. Our foreign board does not have that component. So that's gone. Right, next, I'm gonna move over our Logic EEPROM. And I like to have this thing pretty heavily covered in flux so that it doesn't fly away. And we will just carefully move that over. If there's one component in the entire shop that's gonna disappear, it will be this Logic EEPROM. Okay, we're loose. I'm not gonna sit that down or play games or do anything with it. We just move it right on over here and sit it down where it's gonna live. <gasps> oh, Jason just had a heart attack. Okay, it's gonna get sat down now because I've lost its orientation. <sighs> it almost wound up in the abyss. So let's check the proper orientation of that Logic EEPROM, shall we? All right, so pin one will go toward the CPU. Simple, right? Simple, pin one toward the CPU. All right, so that's gonna sit in there just like that. Let's try to be a little more careful this time, shall we? Losing this component, it's not an option. That it would be the end of the game. If this component gets lost, it is game over. All right, I'm seeing it settle into place nicely. All right, that is on the board where it is going to live for the next few hours at least. Okay, now then it's time to start cleaning up the CPU. There's officially nothing left on this customer's board that we need for data. Okay, so here we are looking at the CPU. And this one fared pretty well, honestly. I'm gonna get a blob of low melt on here and start the process of lowering the melting point of everything. Now you can absolutely just get the low melt on the tip of your iron and blob it around and stuff. I just, this makes for a really calm, relaxing way to cover the CPU and low melt. And um, it also makes it so that I can absolutely get plenty of it on here. What I'm trying to say is I know that it is very well diluted. So I don't think I actually got enough on my um, toothpick, which is okay, because I'll just use my iron to spread it out. All right, I think we are slowly coming up onto temp here. I see things starting to melt. Oh yeah, baby. And we're gonna add some flux to this. There we go. Yes, we're gonna make us a concoction of conglomerate solder slop. Here we go. Now, I'm going to use my micro pencil and begin blobbing this stuff around. And my goal here is to get rid of all of the crappy lead free solder and replace it with this even crappier low melt. Oh no.
And honestly, on one that doesn't have any glue hardly at all on it, it may not even be necessary to go all the way down to 138 degree alloy. Uh, on the sandwich boards, I normally put the CPUs back on using leaded. Uh, that is because the sandwich has to go back together using 138, or at least that's the way I put them back together. And um, if, We put it back together with 138, then of course, putting the sandwich back together would ruin it. All right, let's keep going. This is gonna be a really easy cleanup. We're actually almost done, and I just started. Never be too comfortable. Like, sure, it's an easy one, but I could still very easily nick a vital organ, nip a little nerve ending here, and then this thing would never, never work. Or it would wind up causing me hours and hours of work to fix it. All right, so we're ready to switch the Q-tips. All of the glue that I need off of here is gone. And um, let's put a little more flux on here. I love how wiping flux over oxidized pads gets rid of the oxidized pad. It's marvelous. Oh, I see one that did not switch. We have a ball here that is not low melt. Which is dangerous. If you have balls that are not low melt, and even more dangerous is I lost track of which one it was just now. But anyways, balls without low melt can tear the pad off. There it is, right here. Yeah, non-low melt balls will tear pads off. Okay, almost there.
All right, that's got our chip cleaned up. I'm gonna pop it up off my hot plate. And I always try to keep them from just going from hot to instantly cold. So I'm gonna hold it up off that hot plate for a little bit while the chip cools and just kind of hold it in this hot bubble of air. Okay. Okay, this is actually looking really good. Got ready to slap some new balls on it. <laughs> it's got a really good feeling to it. That's a nice sign. Am I still recording? All right, let's get some fresh paste in here. Come on, baby. Whoop. Come a little faster than I thought. Okay, this all looks really good. Wait. I think I got a straggling ball. What's up with this one right here? There we go. Alrighty then, that should have us a brand, actually an old CPU with brand spanking new balls on it. All right, now just to make sure there are isn't any funny business going on. I'm going to get some flux on here and float this sucker once more. Uh. Oops, way too much flux. Okay, we'll st stop right there. Holy mackerel. Okay. Take it. 
So there you have it, folks. We have a beautifully rebald A14 CPU with semi-symmetrical, if not symmetrical, non-hairy, let it blows. Let's go ahead and set this aside in a safe place. And I'm going to do NAND. I should actually just do NAND first. Okie dokie, I have NAND on the heater and gosh, you know, it looks like I might have lifted a pad right here. Let's be extra careful with this. You know, sometimes it is a tough call as to who did it, but I'm going to take the blame for this one. Uh, my hot air was a little bit not hot enough whenever this was coming off. And this NAND is the reason why I went up on temperature for the CPU. But as you can see, this has been raised up off of here like this. And by the looks of it, that's gonna be a not connected pad. But I am gonna look at that quite a bit closer before moving on. But it's honestly, it's still functional the way that it is. As long as I remember that it's messed up and don't just off the board with my wick. All right, so let's get some flux on here. And I'm just gonna get me a nice big old blob of uh, solder. Let's start blobbing that around on here. It looks like we pretty well got just as lucky on NAND as I did the CPU. There's not hardly anything left over here. And honestly, I think you could just pull these off of here and just straight reball them and do nothing else. like. I think you could do that. I need a little more flux in here. There we go. All right, that looks pretty good. We're gonna leave it. Let's slap some nice shiny new humps on it. I'm gonna take us some leaded paste and just smear this down in here nicely. You may notice that I do waste quite a bit of paste, but honestly, this stuff dries up and becomes hard as a rock faster than I can use it all. Um, and then I wind up saving the container of hardened crap. And I believe I can just like add some flux to it and get it stirred and, and kind of bring it back around again. But as it is now, when this stuff dries up hard as a rock, I stop using it and buy a new tub. So here we go. Let's get some new humps on here, shall we? I have got my hot air set on 340 degrees C with an airflow of 40. And I'm gonna start warming this up. I will warm it until the billions of tiny little microscopic solder beads turn into some nice, shiny, leaded humps. Any moment, fellas. Here we go. Drum roll, please. Yeah. Now, because these don't look like nice, shiny leaded humps, they sort of look like filthy, filthy, dirty humps. I'm going to add some flux and heat once more, and that should shine them right up for us. And I almost messed up, it looks like. I 
There we go. Don't touch the stencil. For crying out loud. Now, before moving this away from reballing station B here, I'm going to have one more look at it to make sure it don't need any floating. And it don't. We're going to leave it just like that. There you go. We have a nicely refurbished NAND with beautiful, non-hairy, leaded humps. <clears throat> Ow! Alrighty then. Well, that is all of the hard work aside. I've got the donor board prepped. At least I hope I do. Um, we have the CPU and the NAND reballed. The hard stuff's over, folks. Um, now it's time to slap these on the new board and see what happens. I'm gonna be putting NAND on here first. This is the second chip set or set of chips for this board. I'm just removing some Q-tip fuzz from the cleanup. I pulled the chips off of it and then wicked it and wiped it down. And now this thing is ready for a brand spanking new set of chips. So I'm just gonna warm this up and sauce it with some fresh flux. About to do it. And then our NAND is gonna sit just like that. And I'm just going to keep heating this up and waiting for it to fall down onto the board, which it should do any moment. I see a little shimmy. I see another little shimmy. And then I've seen it straighten itself out. That means it is floating. There we go. Now, without letting this cool off too far, because I want to be certain that I burn my fingers as much as possible, I'm going to flip this board over and slap the CPU on here. So same thing here. I know I think I have plenty of flux on the CPU already, so I'm not going to be uh, you know, too generous here with this. Just a little bit. Can always add more. It's hard to take it away. Okay, so for lining this up, we're just gonna look at the little blocky things on the bottom, make sure they fall into their slots on the board, and just kerthunk it right on over. It'll go like that. Reinstalling this for me, the hardest part is making sure it's centered. There's not too much, too many places it can go, but it's really difficult to see the actual edge of the CPU because you're always, you know, I'm always looking at the edge of the RAM, but what's most important is the edge of the CPU. And there should be just enough of a gap for me to fit my blade through on both sides. As you can see, we're a little off to one side. Okay, I think that is actually looking pretty good right there. I'm going to start warming this up. And when I'm not doing a video, I'm typically warming it up like this. I don't use the microscope. And I'm watching for flux to bubble. And I'm also wanting to make sure that the entirety of the board gets warmed up evenly. Um, right before the CPU falls, I'm going to switch back to the microscope. I really need to order up a new nozzle or two for my hot air so I can have a uh, angle on the end of the nozzle. So I don't have to do this. Okay. Okay, I'm going to switch back over to the microscope. And we're watching for this chip to drop. I'll give you one of the corners so that you can actually see it. And that's something that's 
Not a very big chip, but it's still too big to fit in the view of my microscope camera. Okay, I'm watching for flux to bubble. You just seen the whole chip move. There it goes. Sitting down in place. Trying to be really careful not to let that flux bubble too much. I have way too much flux on this chip. All right, we are on there nicely, possibly even a little bit too nicely. I think I heated just a tiny bit too far. And we are about to find out what happens when we hook it to the power supply. So here's what that looks like from the side. We have a nicely placed CPU. Everything looks like it lined up pretty much perfectly. And, um, that is on both sides, so that's a good sign. Ah, this is the moment. This is the moment we find out if it's all been for nothing. And also, if it was all not for nothing, will the CPU, EEPROM, NAND combination allow us to switch to the other side of the world variant of the board? Let's get some probes hooked up, shall we? All right, here we go. I'm gonna turn the power supply on. Can you guys feel my anxiety? Here it comes. 40, 30. We're gonna be in good shape here. Oh, why'd you stay at 30? You're supposed to go to zero. I'm not liking that 30 milliamp load there, guys. That should be zero, not 30. I do have a lot of other things on the end of this, so still should be zero. 40, 30. We're gonna run with it. Let's see if it'll boot. All right, here we go. Moving in for the boot prompt. Drum roll, please. Hundred, hundred and fifty. Sony, 200, 90, 700. Let's hook up a screen. Yes. We have bootage going on. All right, so let's just go ahead and get us a screen hooked up here. I wanna see if we got bootage. And even though I do have this crazy 30 milliamp load, we're gonna run with it and see if this thing will boot. Boot prompt, 100 milliamps, 150. Two hundred. Apple logo. All right, let's let this thing start up. I'm gonna make sure we have working touch and um, I'm just gonna leave it right like it is. I'll have to blur that so you can't see the wallpaper. And there we go. This thing is up and running with working touch. This one is a bit unique because we did take the foreign board and swapped all of their components over to the United States board that has all the 5G hardware and whatever else is on that board. And it does actually work. Now, I don't know if it would work without the um, without changing that board ID resistor. I don't. I, it most likely would not. It's very important for the board ID to match. But uh, yeah. yeah, that's exciting. All right. So from here, I'm going to do just a bit more work to get a backup of this board, and uh, this is going to be a really happy customer. That is going to be the end of this video. I really thank you all for watching. If you like this video, please slap that subscribe button, and I will see you in the next one. Have a good day, everybody. Okie dokie, it is around 6 a.m. and I have got the data transferred. 
I think pretty much all of you are wondering, since he made a mistake on that Boost LX coil that wasn't actually the charge coil, which is actually required to boot, what do you think the chances of me radically mismatching this coil causing our little 70 milliamp and brain dead state is? I don't think that was the case, but I need to clear my conscience here, fellers. See, if I put this coil on a board that I know that works, that I've just transferred data off of, and it goes back to being 70 milliamps and brain dead, that means I potentially did an entire board swap for nothing. All right, here we go. 160. Come on, baby. 150. 30, did I hold it down too long? Maybe. So then, this board does not actually boot with the wrong coil here, but it doesn't draw such a small amount of current as like 70 milliamps. So I think even if I had put the proper coil on that other board, it would not boot because this is not causing the same symptoms. I think that board, that other board had like, you know, another problem that was similar. I'm gonna try to slap the original coil back on this board just one time here to make sure I did not disrupt the CPU because I had to heat it up pretty hot to get this off of here. What do we get now with the proper coil? Here we go, 160. And we are back up to normal Boot sequence. Yes.